Greetings in the name of him who makes it possible to say he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. Let's listen for the word of God in these texts that have been assigned me tonight. Hebrews 9.15 For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance, eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The second passage is from Hebrews 12, <clears throat> But it's kind of like a diamond set in a cluster here, and I want to read a little bit more than just that verse. Beginning with verse 18, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let the Spirit who inspired those words so long ago breathe through them afresh and make them live for us. It was judgment day and an angry mob milled about on the plains. People had come from everywhere to judge God. In their frustration, some shouted one thing and some another. How can God judge us? What does he know about our fears, our dreams, our struggles? Let him come down off that heavenly throne and find out how we feel. Let him come where we are. Yes, cried a poor man. Let him be born in poverty, work with his hands, be a nobody, one of the faceless poor. An Israeli responded, let him be born a Jew and persecuted because of his faith. A black joined in and let him be discriminated against all his life. An unwed mother added and let his parentage be questioned continually. The crowd continued to rail against God, heaping up conditions for his qualifications. A prisoner shouted, let him be seized by the authorities, tried without counsel and condemned without justice. Let him feel the full tyranny of the state. A young draftee cried and let him die young with a heart full of unfulfilled dreams. And an atheist added, and let him die calling on a God who does not intervene. They cried themselves hoarse, piling up accusations against an absentee God, agreeing that he had no idea what their life was like. He'd have to live it out, die their death, and be raised if ever he was qualified to be their judge. Well, of course, you know by now that scene is unreal. Or is it? Literally, it's not true. And yet, in a deeper sense, uh, soul-searing, wrenching, self-exposing, time-defying, world-embracing sense, it is true. Amen. It's exactly the charges the Hebrew writer was having to face. You want somebody who knows the real you? 
You need somebody who knows you through and through and cares about you still. You want one of your own to be your go-between? Is that what you want? One who will never forget where he came from, nor where he's going, nor what his business is. You want somebody who not only knows and cares, but will spend himself on your behalf and can change things all around. You want that? Somebody that can take away your night fears, your bad dreams of Judgment Day, actually clean you up instead of spraying you with this deodorant and letting you go till the stench returns. You want somebody like that? You want somebody that can help you not turn over a new leaf but a new life? Is that what you want? Somebody that can lead you right into the presence of Almighty God and say, Father, she's my sister. He's my brother. And have the Father get down off that throne and walk over and embrace you, crying softly, my child, my dear child, welcome home. Is that what you want? Now let me tell you. You can't find it. Even in the angels. That's what he's saying to them. You won't find it there. In the greatest leaders we've ever had. You won't find it in Moses or Joshua or Colin Powell or whoever. You won't find it in the dazzling, mystifying, hypnotizing, sacrificial system presided over by the priest, even the high priest. You will find it in the one who himself has been perfected, has offered the complete sacrifice, and entered into the Holy of Holies itself. Thought when I came up here, I was just about to go through the curtain. He knows the way. He's found it. He's lived it. And you won't find it anywhere but in him who is the sacrificial Lamb of God, at the same time, the high priest that offers that sacrifice, the beginning and the end, both the offering and the one making the offering, a perfect offering, who is our go-between, our mediator. He it is that brings us to God, and he it is who effects the new relationship. Amen. He incarnates the new relationship. And through our faith union with him, makes it real not only to us, but in us. Now, some of our brethren who are just finding out about grace early in the, in the game, make it effective for us, but not in us. And God, Jesus Christ, does both. Now, recently I found a sermon on the mediator, and since I'd been assigned this topic, you can bet I read it eagerly. And it was by G.C. Brewer, and those of you that are the non-instrument group at least know he was one of our greatest preachers. So I read it, and it was all very biblical and very dull. I knew and knew that you knew what a mediator is before I got up here tonight. I knew and, you knew and knew that you knew what a mediator does. We had it drilled into us, most of us from childhood, that Hebrews is addressed to people versed in Judaism who in the midst of persecution for being Christian were sorely tempted to turn back to the old faith which was viewed more tolerantly by Rome. I knew and knew that you knew the main thrust of the argument. Christ superior to every prior revelation. God's had a lot of revelations. Let's don't say nobody ever saw God. God's had a lot of revelations, but none of them could equal this one, he says. Whether it was prophetic or priestly or whatever, I knew and knew that you knew the arguments about the covenants. Some of us were born and bred on them. The New Testament replaced the Old came effective on the death of the testator. I knew that you may or may not know there were all kinds of covenants in the ancient Middle East. 
suzerainty covenants, which were covenants between unequals, that is, a lord and a vassal, parity covenants, which were covenants between equals, um, various kinds, patron covenants, promise covenants, and we've, we've already been told about promise covenant, and our covenant is really a promise covenant, but it's a suzerainty covenant at the same time. Now, <clears throat> our word covenant translates the Hebrew berith, probably from the Akkadian meaning space between, and refers to the right of dividing an animal, as in Genesis 15. Remember the story of Abraham? When he cuts these animals in half, stands and waves off the birds of prey, darkness falls over it, and he has to walk up and down. Walk up and down between them. And all this, the deep sleep, the terrifying darkness, the smoking fire pot, the flaming torch passing between the carcass halves, signified something of the awesome nature of the covenant. The power and the fidelity that was required of those who entered into the covenant. Often an oath as in the case with God, certainly, committed them both body and soul to the keeping of the covenant. And covenant, by the way, covenant is the climactic concept, the, the supreme motif that keeps the Bible together. God saying, God swearing, I'll be your God. I will be your God. I used to be my people. Through his acts and his words, God established a permanent relationship between his people, with his covenant people. A relationship whose fundamental troth or troth is steadfast love. That's what it is. This troth is faith or fidelity. It's a pledged troth, which ends in a betrothal. Now, I knew and knew that you knew that God's people broke that covenant over and over again and over again. And that the prophets saw the need and the promise of a new covenant that would be inward in nature, that would involve an intimate acquaintance, a personal knowing of the Lord. And I knew and knew that you knew that I'd point straight to Jesus as the one who effects that covenant. That in him it comes alive. And that in him we would intimately know God, know him not simply as creator, not simply as judge, Lord, almighty, but God as father, as our visitant brother, and our ever-present friend. And I knew too that after we knew all that, we could respond with a nod and a yawn. The question that I wrestled with in coming here tonight was how can, first of all, how can I see this mediator? And how can the new covenant spring alive in me and through me if I'm going to be of any help to anybody? Because the coin has worn a long time and it's worn smooth by continuous handling and my imagination grows weak and tame and the flame burns low. So how can the breath of God blow on it and make it glow and blaze and leap again? That, that's what I... So one evening as I came home, my wife told me of seeing Soviet children as for the first time they encountered the story of Jesus' crucifixion. And when the nails were driven into his hands and feet, the horror swept across those little faces. And some children gasped and others buried their heads in their arms. Tears flowed, and cries escaped pressed lips. They simply could not believe the inhumanity, the horror, the cruelty. And they certainly could not hear that story and just turn away passively if, as if nothing had happened. And for those of us who have heard the story a thousand times, and some of us have and more, Temptation is to say amen at the appropriate places, but the agony and the ecstasy 
awaits some future moment when the action on stage turns into reality. What does it mean to me that Jesus is my mediator? At times there can be more passion elicited in the efforts of Richard Holbrook to bring Bosnians and Serbs together. Or Warren Christopher bringing Palestinians and Jews together. Or Nelson Mandela bringing Afrikaners and black Africans together. What does it take to see Jesus Christ bringing all races and all classes and all ages and, and everybody together as one family under God with me included? What does it take? made friends with one another from whom we have so long been estranged. I think first I have to know I'm lost, that I'm estranged. Cut off, locked out, alone. Guilty, despairing, alone. Weak, hostile, alone. Unless I take sin seriously, there is no way on earth I can take grace seriously. Amen. Unless I know I'm lost, I don't know what it is to be found. Amen. Now, unless I can come to see the wounded heart of God, I shall never grasp the pain that throbs and tears and burns and sears in the act of forgiveness. It so easily slips off the lips. But that's what we're talking about, the terrible cost of forgiveness. And unless I know that cost, I shall never truly love. Amen. And how can that be real to me? The question to me is how can it be real to me again? Because once it was. I, my memory is fading at this stage of the game, but this I remember well. Waking in the night with terrible dreams of the judgment day and always being lost. And my mother running to the bed down the hall and her soft hand on my head saying, Roy, it's all right. It's all right. I'm right here. I'm right here. And that was enough for the moment. Perhaps for the night. For she was my mediator. She was a good one. And a loving one and a persuasive one. Her presence was all I needed. She didn't have to make a speech. She didn't have to give me an explanation. All she had to be was just be there. But like the sacrifices of old described in Hebrews, it didn't last. It wasn't permanent. It didn't completely cleanse a guilty conscience. It didn't completely dispel a deadly fear. My relationship with my mother seemed secure. Not my relationship with God, though. That awaited another dark night of the soul. Another cry of desperation. Another presence in the blackness saying, It's all right. I'm right here. It was this presence that took away my bad dreams. My nightmares. My bad conscience. My black daylight. My suffocating aloneness. A presence wearing the face of God. Whose eyes shine with compassion and mercy and hope. Oh, I knew the arguments. I had been making and preaching them for some time. The covenants were the testaments. The old law and the new law. The old law was in effect till the cross. Nailed there, it was rendered null and void. Its statutes and ordinances no longer in place. Ordinarily, I just ignored that 50-day period till Pentecost, that sort of twilight zone between the end of the old and the inauguration of the new. Oh, sure, I knew that ingenious way of smuggling in a mini-dispensation of John the Baptist, but there could only be three dispensations, you know. I knew and preached the so-called plan of salvation. I'd been baptized. Twice. I'd fulfilled the legal requirements. But like somebody else, a long time ago, I said, what lack I get? 
Now, you may think me a heretic now or a fool, and I may be both, but I was baptized again a third time. This time, I knew what it meant. I knew what it's supposed to mean. I knew what it did mean to those early Christians. I wanted it to mean that to me. I wanted to do just exactly what they did in just the way they did it. I knew it was the climactic moment, the moment of decision, the moment of acceptance, the moment of utter self-identification with Jesus Christ all the way from death to life, utter trust in him, giving up on self, turning it over to him, the demarcation line between the old loyalties and the new, between the old life and the new, the old nature and the new, all that, and I wanted it to mean that to me. But I discovered something. I'd already made that commitment. Already sung in my soul, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And now bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. I couldn't take it back and do it all over again. I found that out. That discovery was both fear-filled and wonder filled. It was fearful in that there was no way on earth now for me to experience baptism as those earliest people did. No matter how much I wanted to or how many times I tried. No way. It was wonder filled in that I found the covenant not written on paper with ink, but first made in flesh and blood now vibrantly alive, saying, it's all right, I'm right here. It didn't say, too bad, you tried, but you flunked out. I'm right here. The new covenant was alive and present in him. Not the New Testament scriptures, not the new law understood as a code, but the Savior, the Redeemer, the Lord, the Mediator, the Friend, the new relationship with and in Him. A relationship based not on consummate law-keeping, but on God and God's promise. Visible, present, dynamic, active, right there in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I tell you, there is a sense in which the new covenant is the new law. But let me explain. When the law is understood as God himself, God's nature, God's holiness, the way he is, God's faithfulness, God's justice, God's grace, God's creative, self-sacrificing love, by and to and in which we are reconciled. There is the law in that sense. In a secondary sense, the law is that pressure on us and in us to come square with God. Now, originally justification came out of just to make straight, to make square, and to be square with God. So that pressure, whether on us or in us or around us or however it comes, to come square with God, that can be called law in that secondary sense, to live in line with God. It's both the lure and the lash, and they're both out there now. The lure and the lash of God. Thirdly, it's the articulation, whether oral or written, of the nature, the implications of that living that out. But the covenant is not one of these latter. Not the lure and the lash, whether through nature or scripture. Not the articulation of what it means to be right with God, although much of this, New Testament at least, much of the old really, is telling how to do that. But the covenant is God's affirmation of himself to us, his own promise of himself, his outreaching to us, his oath, his pledge Amen. to be God if we just be his people. Amen. Now the failure of the old covenant was not that it was half an oath, that it was a partial pledge, that it was a weak affirmation, that it was a timid outreach. We've he heard the passage already that the fault was in us, and that's true, but that's not the whole truth now. The, 
there is something else to be added to. That thought the fault was in us and not in the law. But there is an inability in the law to reveal God completely. God cannot say himself simply in words any more than you can say yourself in words. God cannot say himself in his creation. An artist can say a lot about himself or herself in the creation, but not the totality of it. So God could not be fully God's self in the law, not even in the host of angels, as the Hebrew writer says. Not in all that sacrificial system, impressive as it was. In the smoking mountain, as we read a while ago, a table of stones, and he certainly couldn't be one of us. And yet that's precisely what he must be. If we're to ever hear and see and know. He could swear it to the angels. He could write it in flaming letters across the sky. We could go on saying, he doesn't really know me. Doesn't know where I hurt. Let him come where we are. Live our life. Die our death. And be raised again. Then he can know. And then he can help. And so God said, I'll sit, quit sending messengers and I'll go myself. And now we see who he is and what he's like. We hear his voice, not that of another. We hear not a word about him, but his word, his oath, his pledge. Now we don't have an invitation in the mail, we have a personal call. Amen. Now I want to be clear, this is not pure mysticism I'm talking about. In the flesh, we cannot see God. We can't go to God, seek and find God. God must on shepherd's feet come seeking us. Come where we are, live our life, die our death, make the effectual sacrifice, move behind the curtain, open up the way into heaven where we can go with him. He is our sacrifice. And he's our high priest taking that sacrifice into heaven. And he relates us to God in a new and fresh and living way. Amen. It's the personal relationship of father-child. It's the, it's the new relationship of the family. It's the new relationship where the law, his nature, his will, his wish, is instilled within us, written on the hearts. And we want to be obedient. We want to be faithful. We want to love and serve. We want to rejoice within the family circle. And the covenant is alive in Jesus Christ. And by contagion, it becomes alive in us. Vibrant, Amen. dynamic, creative, new. Now, to this end, the writer of Hebrews points out the nature of the sacrifice offered for us that opens up the new relationship to us, and then becomes effective in us. I want to say that it was not an ordinary sacrifice. It was not simply a death. That is the destruction of a life. Too many times I think we feel like, well, it just took a life, and it took a sinless life, and so he gave it. But there were three people that died on that Black Friday, and only one of them could be the effective and effectual sacrifice. It was not death now. It was not even the death of a sinless being. For an angel could have made that sacrifice. Or a baby. Or a bull. Or a goat. Or a pigeon. They're all sinless. It was one particular life. Offered up in death. That is offered up to the full. Absolutely, totally, completely offered up. It was one particular life that could effect this opening. Now, the only offering, op offering that could cleanse the guilty conscience was referred to by Brother Leon today when he read the passage about doing the will of God. That's a part of Hebrews that we, we kind of do short shrift. Well, but listen now. We know this verse... For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Why? Why is it impossible? Because God said it was. He could make, no, that's not why it's impossible. 
It won't cleanse the guilty conscience. It won't do it because we know that's tinkering, playing with sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, now we don't believe this part, but he said it anyhow. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Well, of course he did. No, he said you didn't. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me. Ah, a body you prepared for me. Now, we may not get it, so he wants to say it again. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. You don't really mean it. Yes. Then I said, see, God, I have come to do your will, O God. 10, 4 to 7. And that's a quotation from Psalm 40. But it clearly sounds the prophetic rather than the priestly note. Micah had distilled the message in a single sentence, sharpened into a question. Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, surely you don't mean that. The only thing is that requirement can't be the last word. That's what God requires. But now there must be some way of making it possible to meet that requirement. Jesus echoed that sentiment in Matthew 9, 13 when he said, go and learn what this means. Now, we've learned many a lesson, but I don't know that we've spent a lot of time going and learning what this means. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Amen. Again in Matthew 12, 7, he lifts up the words of the prophet Hosea in 6.6. 6, For I desire mercy, our steadfast love, and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Amen. Now despite all the priestly language of the book of Hebrews, and there's a lot in there. The presentation of Jesus as the high priest. The full and effectual sacrifice. The writer contends that it is the offering of an obedient life, a life straight with God, consistent with the nature of God's self-giving mercy and love. It is that offering of that life that opens up the way into the Holy of Holies because he presents not something fake where God confuses the guilty with the innocent and juggles the books and rearranges the sentence. He offered up exactly what God wants and wants from all of us. Not just Him. Amen. Instead of our ever having to do anything like that, He wants it from all of us. And He says that, and that's not a substitute. Now that's a perfect offering. It's a prepared body. Hebrews 10.5 that has done the will of God. Amen. Now listen to 10.7-10. to 10. And then I said, See God, I've come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book, it's written to me. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, see, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sacrificed through the offering of what? The body of Jesus Christ once for all. And therefore on that Maundy Thursday evening in the upper room at that Passover table, Jesus could break the bread and pass it to the disciples and say, this is my body given for you. He could pour out the cup and say, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. How could he say that? Because he was in process then of beginning to make that final offering. Mm -hmm. now, now listen carefully. It was not blood as blood. It was not blood as blood mm -hmm. that affected the sacrifice. The blood was the life. That's what all the Jews understood. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 17.11 the, the life is in the blood. It was the life of this body that had done the will of God, being poured out to its full. Amen. And so here is the life that God created humanity to live. Not just one. He should be the firstborn of many. Amen. A host. But we can't do it. 
not on our own. We can clench our feet, our fists and teeth and whatever and make all kinds of resolutions. And they're like broken eggshells at our feet before the day is gone. We can't do it by ourselves. But here's the first completed human being. This is what God's after in the new creation. And so when he entered into heaven, he was what God intends all his children to be. Perfected, transformed, metamorphosed, glorified, enthroned. Now, now don't, please don't get bogged down in legalism here. It's true, the Greek, the atheke can mean not only covenant, can mean testament. And once he uses it in that sense. In chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, the new covenant is, is presented as a, as a will. But one time, and it ought not to be taken out of context and mean something it didn't mean there. Because there he uses it solely for the purpose of tying the Christians in eternal inheritance to the death of Christ. It didn't have all that theology that's brought about the testator, this law goes out and that law comes in because the will now has been uh, probated and all that kind of stuff. It is the death of Christ that finally makes our inheritance possible. The writer's presentation, the entire presentation of the new covenant is dynamic rather than static. It is alive rather than inanimate or dead. It's not a legal document. It's a living relationship and that dominates the book. So let's come down to the gist of the matter. Jesus Christ is mediator because he brings us into right relationship. It's new because it's a new relationship. We haven't been in right relationship. It's, it's personal, it's not legal, it's not commercial, it's not mechanical, it's not magical, it's not secondhand, it's not once removed. We aren't made sons and daughters in law, but sons and daughters in love. And the barriers of misunderstanding and recurring guilt, the barriers of shadows and types and forms, the barriers of rites and ceremonies and systems, they're all gone. And our consciences are clean. Why are our consciences clean? Because we know God has been serious about us. And he's been serious about our sin. He hasn't winked at our unfaithfulness. He hasn't smeared goat's blood over it and said, now it's all right. He hasn't really confused Christ with us and said, I'm going to lay all the punishment on him and let you go scot-free. He hasn't done that. He has taken the pain into his own heart and said, it hurts, your sin hurts me, it hurts me immeasurably, but I love you immeasurably, and I do forgive. If we only knew what forgiveness meant, and what it cost, we'd understand. And so it's only then that he says, it's all right. It's only then that he says, it's all right. In the blazing light of God's holiness, before the consuming flame of an incredible love, we stand naked, and unafraid, forgiven, redeemed, accepted, enfolded in a love that will not let us go, wrapped in a grace that grows ever more and more amazing. Now that's the mediator I would like to see again. To see him as he is. To love him as I ought. This is the new covenant I would embrace because it's first embraced me. This is the gift I would accept. Because as it reached out to me, I knew myself gifted and accepted. It's not a law written on tables of stone. It's not from the finest leather volumes. It's not just written in the rotation of the planets. Or in the cells of, of my bone and brain and blood and all that. God's written it wherever he could. But it can't be fully written anywhere except where it has been written. Him who is both God and us at one and the same time who did come and live our life and die our death and has lived the life we are to live and now goes and shows us, not only shows us how, but gives us his mind and his spirit, his passion so that we can be the kind of people he's called us to be. And so... While it's written there, 
It's made possible to us through him who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith till he brings us home. I'm going to close by saying that nearly 60 years ago, I read of a dying child and the estranged parents that were drawn to the bedside. And in the final moments, it reached out with its hands on one side of the bed and grasped the hand of its father and on the other side the hand of its mother and it died. And right there, drawn together by this mutual object of love, they were reconciled. Now theirs was not the old relationship now. It's a new, it's a new relationship. Now, I'm not trying to indicate that ours with God is like that because theirs is a parody relationship now and ours is not. But drawn together by the mutual object of love and devotion, empowered by him who gives us all he is and has to give that we can open up to. We are made new. We are not just called new. Amen. We are made new in Jesus Christ. We are joined in a union that neither death nor hell can shatter. And beyond all theological jargon which I have tried to avoid with you tonight, God's beloved son, our older brother, has made the broken family whole. And at first we don't even stop to ask how. We just simply fall into the arms of him who embraces us freely and eagerly whispers, my child, my precious child, welcome home.